We are here to talk about, Will, some awesome fights that happened at the weekend. And we're here to talk about an awesome card coming up. Uh, but firstly, I want to say to everyone who's listening, man, woman, chimpanzee, child, um, filthy uh, Brazilians as one person calls them, whatever you, whoever you are and wherever you are, please hit the subscribe button. We would love to have you joining in on the conversations below. So comment on the YouTube section below. Uh, if you're listening to this on SoundCloud, comment, iTunes, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all those stuff. Jump on, subscribe, whatever you're on platform-wise. Join in the conversation that is MMA. Please feedback. Please give us questions. We are happy and we're here to answer them all. Uh, and Will, how are you, my friend? How is life treating you? Oh, good. Everything's all good. Just me and the little um, the little one tonight, which is weird. It's the first time we've been on our own since she came into our lives four months ago. So she's fast asleep. So it gives me an opportunity to talk some fights. So uh, looking forward to it. And we are going to talk fights indeed. Uh, I think we'll touch on the uh, Cage Warriors card that just happened this weekend. It was a card worth talking about. Also mention uh, UFC Sao Paulo about some of the results. Ladies and gentlemen, it went on down there. And of course, coming up this week, we have Bellator going down. We've obviously got to give a shout out to big old Bellator. Because we've got a Brit fighting on that card. And then we're also going to mention the kind of small card that is UFC 217. I think it might be worth mentioning, Will. Yeah, I think so, yeah. It's just a little one in New yeah. York. So with these three, three yeah. title fights, nothing much. Yeah, nothing much. And obviously, we're going to answer your questions that you've posted to us, and we've got them. So thank you very much for those. Uh, so, uh, yeah, well, I think Cage Warriors this weekend, Cage Warriors 88, the card itself, I think, had a bigger, bigger meaning than it did, say, two weeks ago before Darren Till put on that performance against Donald Cerrone. Suddenly, there was a little bit more uh, to each fight, especially with the local fighters, the Scouse fighters. and. Some of the fights went the way they should have, but some a bit dubious. But all in all, I thought it was a fantastic card. And I think one person that stood out for me was Chris Fishgold, defending his title uh, and third defence. He keeps the belt and also announced he's going down to 145. Possibly, you know, I think he is a, kind of a penciled-in name to go up to the UFC. I think it would be a great thing to do to get him signed up for the upcoming UK card, uh, potentially happening in March. I think it would be a great a great move for them. Yeah, I think, well, people have gone to UFC from the British Isles for less, so being in there, defending your UFC, your Cage Warriors Championship three times, and uh, I mean, he looked, last night he looked as good as he's really looked at, in Cage Warriors against a tough guy in Jakobsen, and he got him out mm. there in the first round, which is, I, I, I gave Jakobsen a really big opportunity to win that fight, but obviously fighting at home really spurred him on. And, uh, I mean, dropping to 145, honestly, that really shocked me when I heard about it. And like we were saying, it maybe opens the door for uh, his teammate Paddy to move up because he is getting bigger. He's starting to kind of fill it out as a grow into his kind of man body now. So, and uh, mm. fish, fish bowl is a smaller, smaller lightweight. And uh, it maybe will work out better because that 155 is a shark tank. Um, of fighters across Europe, across the world, in the UFC at the high level, even not so high level, it's a really tough division. And um, if he's, he might be a, actually the bigger guy in some of those fights at 145 as well. So a uh, great win for him, it really was. And uh, interesting to see where we see him next. It is indeed. I think one fight I, I kind of feel like we're going to miss out on though, is maybe him facing Soren back. Yeah. Because Soren back has been He's come in and just been a whirlwind in this cage warriors. Uh, and he showed it last night as well against Martin Stapleton, got a submission win, made it look very smooth, very easy. But damn, I would have loved to have seen him versus uh, Fish Gold. I think that would have been a phenomenal matchup. Yeah, I think he's a, he's a really, it's just a, your typical Scandinavian kind of fighter that comes through quite quiet, gets about his business, and does it so efficiently and so quickly. Um, and looks just, just looks awesome. He looks a really solid, solid pro fighter. Um, took steps out. I think it was it the first round. If I remember yeah, right. yeah, first, first round. round so that's that's a nice feather in your cap against uh, a guy who's been around for as long as uh, Martin Stapleton has been. So yeah, really, really solid win. 
it's um, interesting to see what he does next because UFC could sign him. Scandinavian fighters are always people that they, they, they take up there if they're represented by the right people, which he probably is. Uh, taking a guess at it, but um, yeah, it, that would have been a good fight. Yeah, it would have been awesome. And mm. I think maybe because if uh, Fiskal leaves that belt open, they might end up doing a, a, a vacant matchup. They are potentially talking about uh, doing super, another Super Saturday card, which, if I'm honest with you, I might even look to maybe get myself down for that because the last one they did was phenomenal. If they do that again, it would be something I'd be looking forward to. Uh, also, mate, some awesome wins. Uh, Molly McCann put on a, a really dominant performance against a girl, Priscilla De Souza. Even though De Souza didn't quite make weight, she was a far more experienced fighter, and Molly McCann didn't show that. She looked absolutely fantastic. Could have, or maybe the referee thought about maybe stopping the fight because she was absolutely mauling. But good times, you know, good promising prospect in Molly McCann. Uh, and she's another name for that uh, potential UFC Liverpool card. Yeah, yeah, it's um, nice to see some that, that UK talent, women especially, coming through. And um, she's she's doing well for herself. I mean, she's she's kind of moved up levels very slowly. She's got herself into cage warriors, which I think is always a big deal personally. Um, and she's come in and she's she's did the did the job. Looked very very dominant. And she took. Um, took her opponent kind of to the woodshed and could have really finished that fight. I thought I thought it could have been stopped, but um, interesting to see. I think if she stays around, I think the right thing to do for Cage Warriors is put her in a title fight with. You could bring someone in from the, the US or wherever and uh, make a title fight there. Once she wins the belt, there's only one place for her to go, and that's to the UFC. And I fully expect to see her by the summer next year being a staple in the UFC. Um, over there and uh, fighting all over Europe. Yeah, absolutely. And I think let's give a mention because uh, you're a Scotsman. Uh, yeah. Paul, Mc Paul McBain getting a win against Sam Spencer with an uh, absolutely terrifying uh, TKO stoppage by the doctor, really, that eye injury that Sam Spencer had. It, it suited the Halloween theme for the weekend, I have to say. But uh, Paul McBain looking solid. Great addition to the lightweight division again. This is more emphasis on how deep this 155 division is and he's a great great kind of name to watch out for really and hopefully help the cage warriors brand go up to scotland and give him a good reason to well hopefully that's that it'd be nice to have something up here whether it be up north in aberdeen because i say really the talent that is coming through scotland at the minute is coming from the, especially in cage warriors it's coming from the north of the country so mm -hmm. um away up there in adam shone's land up in aberdeen and inverness so um, they could possibly put on an event in Aberdeen. I could see that. They've got a, a decent sized arena in the, the EECC in Aberdeen. Um, I would probably make the trip up to it. I, in fact, I know I would make the trip up to it. Um, but it's nice to see a couple more Scottish guys coming through because after Stevie went to the UFC, we had Robert, uh, we had Whiteford, Jojo, um, Stevie, and then Paul Craig came in. There's, it, and there's nothing, been, nothing else really kind of coming through. But it's nice to see these guys. I knew about Ross Houston a long time ago. I knew about McBain's a quiet guy that I, I knew about, but never heard much about. Um, and he's really both guys seem to be a skill level seem to be getting bigger and better every fight we're seeing them. So I'm looking forward to see what they do next. And um, you know, Cage Warriors is going to match them up with solid, solid competition, and um, hopefully they can continue winning and. Just that it'd be nice to see a few more Scots out there as far as uh, us Scots to get behind. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, let's mention the last fight, though, uh, but he is uh, the Lee Chadwick Victor Cheng fight. Uh, if it's if you get a chance to watch it, don't. Um, it's not a world title fight worthy matchup. It wasn't uh, anything right home about. Lee Chadwick got this slight decision win. Uh, they scored it uh, three to two for him. Uh, me and Will, we've spoke about this off. Fair, but we both scored it for Victor, if I'm honest with you. It was that fifth round that swung it. Um, but I definitely had it down for Victor myself. Uh, John McGuire as well had it down, the same as I did. Uh, well, I speak to him on Twitter. Um, but I can't really understand how I would use Lee Chadwick or Victor Cheng as my poster boy champion. Uh, I think that 
neither of them are worthy of being a, a kind of world well i know teach voice called it world championship and fair enough they, they get people from all around the world fighting on the cards but if you think about the names that have held that title michael bisping is it, oh no he's not Michael bisping sorry not Mike bisping uh like you got your jack and manson you jack Mark, they would absolutely tear the pair of them up yeah. like wouldn't even be a fight wouldn't even be close they would absolutely mull them and i do feel that the, the middleweight division for them has taken a drop down a level a standard down and i don't think either these parties should be really holding that belt i don't think they they have the depth yet to have that division yeah i think it's just, i think it's across europe i think the europe middleweight seems a little bit of a dip at the minute mm. but um oscar Pachoa, who fought in gdansk last week i think he was the previous champion i think you beat both guys yeah. so yeah, yeah um it's just UFC, the UFC, the cage warriors have got to put on fights, and they've got too much. If you've got a vacant belt, you've got to pick the two guys that you think's going to are the guys next to the line to fight for that championship. Uh, not a great fight, um, pretty sloppy. I edged it for Victor Cheng, but it, being a, being in Liverpool, you, you've got the crowd on your side, and if you're striking and getting takedowns and you're making noise for that guy, it's going to show a little bit more maybe in the and it could deceive the, the judges a little bit. But a close fight really could have went either way. I had it for Cheng. Uh, but I'd be very surprised if I see um, our Cage Warriors middleweight champion get promoted to the UFC. But it's like I was saying with Fishgold, he's dead enough. He's did more than enough to get that opportunity to go there. I don't think um, Chadwick has. So... We'll, we'll see what we'll see where we go. If not, he'll be defending his belt in in his hometown again next year. So it's it's pretty much a win win for the guy whether he does get promoted or whether he doesn't. So yeah, it does. And so look, let's go on, bro, to the fight card we had in Sao Paulo, which last week you and I were buzzing about it. I was really hyped up, and to be fair, I think it delivered on on, on several fights in several ways. It had some absolutely fascinating results and let's go first and foremost let's start from the bottom work our way up uh, very quickly touch on uh, Marcello Golm getting the win against Colombo it was absolutely shocking uh, Colombo is absolutely ta he is dire he is one of the worst heavyweights I've ever seen in my life grace the UFC roster uh, if he can get in I'm going to not cut any more weight and I'm getting signed up next week that is how easy it seems to be getting to the heavyweight division uh, he announced he was retiring when he walked away from the cage I think he retired before he even stepped in there. I think when he signed that UFC contract, he retired. But, but it happened. Um, yeah, it happened. Yeah. I see, I haven't, I, like I said to you, I've not even watched the fight. I was at work at this point, and um, I just heard that Colombo didn't do an awful lot. I think Gomes not overly that good either. Um, I'll, I will watch it eventually when I have to watch film on Gome next time. But... Um, yeah, uh, the right guy won really because if Colombo is, if he's thinking about retirement or he retired, he, he probably had thoughts beforehand um, regarding that. So, him getting out now and giving like this young guy's got a win now, so he's first in the UFC, first win in the UFC, it's the right thing. So, we'll see where Gome goes from here. Colombo, just not a great fighter, in all honesty, but the right guy won. So, so hopefully, they can UFC need more young heavyweights coming through. Couple of years to the line, he might be one of those guys. So who knows? So we had a matchup which you and I were both looking forward to. Two fa fantastic prospects in that kind of flyweight division: uh, Figueroa against Brooks. And, and if I'm honest with you, there was a bit of controversy from the, the Twitter posse, let's say, about the decision um, because Brooks did get quite a heavy amount of takedowns. But uh, my decision on this, and uh, I was adamant, I was made up with the decision because I was super happy that Figueroa got that decision win on the basis that with the new judging criteria, Brooks didn't win. Brooks, if you can't just get takedowns and do nothing with them, you can't just get a win by being a lay and pray style. His ground and pound wasn't really as powerful as it should have been, so to speak. He was, Figueroa was doing set setups for the submissions, closer getting submissions was landing on the feet as well. He was one who was doing the damage on the feet, hence why Brooks was wanting to get the takedowns because he wasn't doing well on the feet. All in all, I think I am made up of that decision. I, I legitimately am. Uh, it, it was controversial, bro, but it happened. Mm. It was a close fight. I knew it was going to be... I thought ultimately the, the grappling of Brooks would 
to be enough to win him the fight. And ultimately, he he did what he was supposed to do. But when he got those takedowns, he really did jack shit with them. He didn't he didn't do much at all. So, um, like we were saying before, and as well, Figure Figueredo had a really tough cut, like literally crying at the weigh-ins. Uh, at the official, uh, the ceremonial weigh-ins, we had uh, Brooks like mocking him a little bit, and I instantly thought, like, I really want Alcantara to win. Um, I edged it personally just for Brooks, but it's, I, it's, what can you say? I, it just it is what it is. I thought he just edged it with his strike, uh, with his takedowns and his control, but you give it to the guy who's actually more sub attempts. Probably a little bit better striking. He landed takedowns as well, and uh, in Brazil you're going to get that home cooking if close rounds are there. So, and he got that um, in this fight. But see, uh, Brooks, he looks small for 125. We know that he's fought at lower weight classes, but uh, I think what he needs to do is just to keep his mouth zipped like another guy in this card and just fight. And um, he will, he will, he will win some fights in the UFC. But uh, Close fight, but both guys will move on and hopefully they can get kind of better from this. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to go on to uh, the next fight, bro. Uh, gosh, it was worthy of 50 Gs for two guys. Uh, Dos Santos and Griffin, what was your take on that, man? Great fight. Absolutely great fight. Um, Max Griffin was a guy I thought he was going to get bullied around a little bit in this and he came out really, really strong and he put Zaleski down which I didn't see coming. I thought he had the power to do it. I didn't think he had the technical prowess to do it. But Zaleski is so hard-nosed and hard to get out there. And he's going to come into it and he's going to keep going and he's going to keep going for the 15 minutes. And he did that and he just broke. He broke Max Griffin, I think, at the end of the first round. But in saying that, the second round, Max Griffin won that round as well. So that shows you what kind of fighter he is. Never stops, never gives up. Um, and lost that a close, close fight. It's, I don't really think it's a bad loss for Max Griffin for the simple fact that he, he won a, a bonus out of it. Um, you can see how tough a fight is. In your losses, you can show a lot more than being very dominant in your wins. And you, you can tell going forward, he's going to be a tough guy to fight, tough guy to take out. And uh, he's had a bit of a hard run. His two losses are to that guy that, who will not be named, who we'll speak about shortly. And uh, Zaleski, I like Zaleski a lot. I do. I think he's good. But, um, yeah, great, great fight. Really enjoyed it. One of my favourite fights of the year, actually, I think. So, um, But nice, nice to see Zaleski. And I think the news after, his team told him he's going to be a dad as well. So what a way to top off your night and then get a bonus on top of that. Great night. Yeah, exactly, yeah. That'll help buy the nappies, the pseudo yeah. creme, the wipes, yeah. all the essentials. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I have to admit, mate, that, was, like, that first round was one of the best first rounds like they just knocked 20 years off each other it was fucking insane bro it was wild i loved it i was just literally sat watching the fight and just in awe i was like oh my word like griffin like you say tough as coffin nails that kid just coming out oh like he just he didn't even know what year it was he said hey what day of the week is it is and he said pink he just was <laughs> gone but he just kept going kind of muscle memory kicked in all that training and he just just carried on man uh next fight up run uh, was a fight where I tell you what you saw a guy who a is not great going on his back foot and b even in a different weight class not cutting so much just wasn't he just wasn't there mentally you had Gerard uh, Gordon just break Hakran Diaz like I've never seen a fighter so evidently just mentally break like he was like he lost the decision but you just saw him in. Like he sat down between the rounds. Jose Aldo is sat there talking to you. Like if I had Jose Aldo telling me what to do, I'd be like, "Yeah, fuck yeah, let's do it, champ. Let's go. Yeah, let come on." Let. But just nothing. He just was like, just he wasn't there mentally. Like I thought we would have got a bit more out of him because because he wasn't cutting down. I thought because we've seen it a lot now, guys who aren't making those big cuts. They're a lot healthier. They're a lot fresher. He looked good. He looked physically like in good condition. But Gerard Gordon, just that pressure, that pressure. Hakan just didn't get a moment to breathe. He just couldn't get a moment to gather his thoughts to get back into it. And man, it was. I, I was really impressed with Gerard's performance. If I'm honest with you. Yeah, he just he he simply set a pace that 
Hakran Diaz could not keep up with. And he's like he's a he's one of those guys going forward, like that lightweight division is so stacked with fighters. It's it's crazy. That guy's gonna win a, a lot of fights in the UFC. He's gonna mm. break a lot of guys. He's got a will to kind of really make it ugly. And he I think he knows that he can set a pace that other guys can't or a certain amount of guys can't take. Now I don't think he's the most talented fighter, but he's got that will and determination and just that go attitude where he's not going to stop and he, he will break loads of guys in that division with mm. that i think when you, once you've got the guys with the natural talent um like natural talent and just like a, 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 being a talented fighter say like uh like your james beck who i think is a talented fighter across the board and your joseph duffies who are, who are fighting this upcoming weekend um guys like that who have really good skill sets could potentially be but he's going to beat He's definitely going to beat guys in that 155 division just with his sheer willpower and his attitude and uh, his goal and be in your face the whole fight and just beat the utter shit out of you. It's, uh, I couldn't believe... I thought that fight should have been stopped in the second round, personally. I thought when once he... Aldo ran in the cage and literally had to pick Diaz up because yes. he wasn't picking himself up. That fight should have been stopped then, in my yeah. opinion. Um I'm with you. I think a referee should, uh, sorry, I think a fighter should be able to physically get back to his own corner because yeah. I, maybe that, like, maybe like the referee might need to say that way. But I think if you can't get there, that's on you. If you can't physically get up, well, you're not, phys like, if the fight hadn't stopped, if the fight continued, you wouldn't be able to physically move. Yeah. So you shouldn't be continuing. Like, the referee should be taken up. Like, it was technically, he was out. He was fucking gone. He was just like, like, give another five more seconds, that referee would have stopped that fight. So why not just say, dude, you're done? But, like, they didn't, and it was just frustrating. Yeah, I'm with you on that, bro. Yeah, yeah. Right decision. Right guy won. So, like, these old, old guards kind of really fading out now, and these guys are coming forward. Uh, new guys are coming into the UFC. So I very much doubt we'll see Hat Fran Diaz in the UFC again. Mm. He's a guy that I thought would do all right in the UFC, but he's kind of really faded, um, maybe since USADA came in. Which is, I'm not saying that he was on something, but he possibly, he's just not really looked the fighter that I thought he could be in the UFC. So we probably won't see him again. Like, I kind of actually can't wait to see Jared Gordon. I think he can match him up with a lot of good guys. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Next up, we had the Welshman, Jack Marshman, going up against Antonio Carlos Jr. Sadly, it did not go Jack's way. And Antonio Carlos Jr. basically really starting to fit into that middleweight mould, you know, starting to get. I think comfortable with the weight and the size of being a 185er and you know he's basically tr he's trained a lot of striking he had the grappling that's like his that's his go-to if i'm ever stuck i can always fall on this but he just was practicing the striking getting the confidence to use it he used it well caught um jack with a good combo and then after that it was just a case of got it down to the ground and got that rear naked choke which was actually really smooth, really slickly done. Uh, but, bro, it, it, it wasn't a reflection on Jack. I think Jack's a solid fighter. His, his stand-up is his go-to. Styles makes matchups, uh, And I think Antonio Carlos Jr. is going to be a really good good addition into like the top 10 middleweights. He'll be a good guy to go into there and start messing around with some of the guys there. Yeah. It must be, it must be a great feeling to have like a skill set that you have there that, that you know if that... If your initial plan does not work, you can always go to that. And once you go to that plan, you've got a high success rate of hitting um, or finishing the fight. It must must be a pretty kind of common feeling that, you know, if one thing's not going right, you've got something there to go back on. So um, what I liked about him, I thought he, he looked good in his feet, like we were saying before. Um, huge reach advantage, used it well. And once once it got to the ground, I was just counting down. I thought if Jack can get to the end of the round, um, he, he might be able to survive. But once Antonio Carlos Jr. kind of put the, the head and arm round the, the neck, I thought you're in trouble here. Jack's going to have to make a move. And once he makes that move, Carlos Jr. is going to counter that, that and he's going to find a way to get a submission. And it, it turned out to be so. The guy's got a lethal, lethal choking game. Um, and he's going to be a guy that will move into that top 15, top 10, like you said, and he's making improvements. He's went to American top team full-time instead of going part-time before, so that's obviously helping. Probably the most 
um, outside maybe Damian Maia was your most popular fighter last night. He got a huge pop from the crowd. Mm-hmm. So the Brazilian fans are getting behind him. Uh, Jack Marshall will be back. He'll be fighting. He'll be fighting for his um, his fans and his country again very very soon. But uh, Carlos Junior looked phenomenal. Yeah, he, Jack. You know he didn't take much damage. To be fair, just a choke. So he'll probably be fresh enough to go again uh, early next year, first couple of months. Uh, I know Gunny Nelson as well. By the way, just want to make him quick thing. He said he's going to be fighting back starting the next year, start next year as well himself. He did put a tweet out. I just want to mention that a bit random, but anyway. So that's kind of good news as well for the European side of things. Uh, next up was a fight where I, Nico Price, he's a guy who's kind of impressed me in the fact that he, he impressed me because he I didn't expect him to impress me, if that makes sense. And he did a lot better than he has done, uh, than I thought he was going to do in the UFC. Come up to this fight, he fought Vincent Luque, who is a guy who has a lot of talent in him and he showed it. He showed it. Coming in short notes as well, Vincent, might I add as well, Vicente, oh, Vicente sorry, or uh, Vicente came in and, and he put a great performance in, really put the hurting on uh, Price, bro, and got that choke on and that was beautiful work all round. He's a really solid fighter, that, that young guy. He's, he's sometimes, I think, like uh, as I said before we came on here, that I think he's one of these guys that short notice fights is going to suit him down to the ground. He doesn't have to train as much for well. He doesn't have to kind of focus as much on that long camp. He's got what he needs to do in those one two weeks that he comes in for a short notice fight. And when he when when he shows up like that, you can see that he's a guy that can become a ranked fighter and beat good guys. He's one of these next generation fighters who's his striking's very good. He puts combinations well together. He's got a beautiful jab that he was using, um, a nice kicking game as well. And then he's got he's got that beautiful dash choke that he loves to use, and he's used it a few times in the UFC now. And uh, big power, set it up well. And once he got the the opportunity to put that choke on, he really um, got Nico Price out there. I think Price was like, right, I'm done here. There's no way that um, I can live with this kid. And uh, he moves on, and it's going to be a Solid fight. I'm interested to see who he fights next, who they match him up with, because I think that's a good win on your record. Don't overly rate um, Price that highly, but I think he's a tough guy. But Luki is a guy who I think can go forward and uh, beat really top, top-notch top guys in that division. And we had a fight of the return of the man of violence, John Lineker. I just get happy. I do. I get a big happy mode on when John Lineker is on a card. Like, there's no reason anyone should be sad when he's fighting because he just he's he's never gonna back off. He's never gonna stand off. He's never gonna be tentative. Uh, John Lineker for Marlon Vera. And what would you take on this fight, bro? Hey, I thought this was going to be fairly easy for for John Lineker, and I think I, I just totally underestimated Chio Vera. And I, I do sometimes I'm really bad for that with certain guys. Um, but that was an awkward style matchup for Lineker for the simple fact that Chio's definitely getting better. You can see that with every fight. He's very long, extremely rangy. Um, Lineker had a lot to kind of overcome in that fight to to really win it because um, of the things I was just saying there. And it, he's like I love watching that guy throw hooks to the body. I don't. There's really not a shot in MMA that I love watching more than that guy throwing heavy leather to the body. But um, I just think he was a little bit, at, at this time in the UFC careers, he's just that little bit better than what Bear is um, and kind of beat him up for the first two rounds. And then Chio kind of came into it later as the fight went on. But it's nice to see him back. I think he needs to, that was a tough fight for Lenica for the fact he's coming off his injury. I think that was his first really huge injury, especially with a broken jaw. You have to trust your jaw and getting hit. And he sometimes gets hit to, to hit his opponent. So, um Fairly convincing, I thought, the first two rounds. And uh, fought smart, I think, in the third round. Didn't need to empty the gas tank to open up the opportunities for, for Cheeto, which he did with Brad Pickett. If you if you give him an opportunity, he can throw, he can throw strikes at you. So uh, nice to see Lenica back. He's going to give you give us exciting fights at the in that division against yeah. a lot of good guys. So happy to see him back. Yeah, he is just. He just brings a smile to my face. He is a violent, violent man. And like I said, yeah, it's a case of he tested his chin out, so to speak, and he's got a feel. He'll have the he'll have more confidence going into the next fight 
to to maybe stand a little bit longer to maybe do with this X Y Z. So John Lineker I, versus Thomas Almeida, make it happen. Ah, do you, can you imagine? Oh, how happen. fun By that fight would be! Violence. <gasps> Oh, gosh, that is just a, a wet dream, that is. Oh, yes, please. Uh, and we had another European fighter on the fight up next, Brody. Jack Manson against Thiago Santos. Now, Thiago Santos took out Jack Marshman. He took out Jack Manson. Thiago Santos is that guy who's... I don't think he's ever going to win the title, but he is like a beast. Like, he is a nasty man to fight. And in that first round, it's when his, or that's when his power is there. And he used it. He landed... He did like a kick to then just do this weird kind of walking forward, like a, it just like walked forward, just swinging like that. And then one of them landed, and and it, it's weird. Like it just what when I watch it back, like at first when you watch it live, you don't notice it as much because you're just like, oh shit, what's going on? What's happening? What's happening? But then when you watch the replay back, it's just like this. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's fucking weird. But he lands the punch, finishes Hermanson on the last second just as the buzzer's going and he gets the win obviously jack and manson probably wouldn't have got up anyway to be fair when the buzzer had gone so it would have been a, it probably would have been a stoppage anyway but for jack uh, for uh, jack it's not the biggest loss in the world he, he will probably come back uh, from it he is tough as he is a tough dude to be fair i think he'll be fine um uh, but for Tiago santos he's a guy who's he need he's what 33 i think now as well he needs to start to really push himself to get himself up into those, you know, those top level guys to really start challenging. Like he, he needs to get back to that when he fought that Gegon Musasi fight where he made the big boo boo. He needs to get a fight like that again. He needs to fight a top guy to really show that he should be up there and really be messing around with them. Yeah, Santos is a, one of those scary guys because he has like unreal power that he can unclock at any minute. And I think in the first exchange. Uh, the first exchanges that him and Jack had, he hurt Jack, and he felt that power, and he's like, "Oh, right, I need to." I, I, I think as well, if that went into round number two, Jack would have come into that fight. So that was like a really big moment for Santos, just hurting him with that last 10, 15 second barrage. And like, like you were saying, it was a, a weird motion. He literally was running forward. He threw like a jump kick to the body, which I don't think really hit, but um, he felt the power. That felt the power that Tiago was throwing. And then he came rushing forward. And he was, he was kind of like, he was like straight. He was huge. Yeah. Throwing these, throwing these huge uppercuts, and he must have caught him with one right in the end of the chin. And uh, that's another guy that's at American Top Team full time now. So you're getting the benefits of literally staying in a gym and doing nothing but train and get better. And probably the best, I think it's the best gym there is out there, facility wise. Um, it's got all everything that you're living in the gym. And it's there, you pretty much go however much or however less you want to do that. So, um, Santos, the guy that I think I said match him up with Brad Tavares, I think that's a good fight, but not overly sold on him as a, a like a top 10 guy. But he's a, a scary guy, he can mm. if he, if he hit you with the right shot, you're going to be looking at the, the lights waking up. So, uh, hope to see Jack back in the new year, and he needs to stay away from Brazil. Uh, as if you're if you're in Europe and you're listening to this, just don't go to Brazil. There's plenty of European cards or North American cards. Just don't go to Brazil. It's just a tough yeah. place to go, and it's uh, just try and stay at home if you can. Yeah, Canada, America, Australia, New Zealand, <laughs> just just anywhere but Brazil. Just yeah. get the fuck away from there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think just Graham Boland just likes to get bloody suntan there. He does. Pain in the ass. Um, you had two veterans of the UFC. Now, Jim Miller, bless him, if he had won that fight against Francisco Trinaldo, would have had the most wins in the UFC, but he lost. Um, bless him. Bless him. Uh, it was close. But, uh, yeah, so it's not – oh, no. Was it? Yeah, yeah, most wins in the UFC. I think it would have been like 29 or something like that. Uh, but Trinaldo got the win. Trinaldo's one of them guys again who's he's just a solid 155er who will eat wins, but he he just always is always going to fall short. He's not going to get a title shot. He's not going to be, but he's just one of them guys who's a he's a marker. If you get past him, you're worthy to go to go to like that next level. If you can't get past him, you're kind of sticking around there for a bit more until you maybe evolve. For Jim Miller, though, I feel like it's kind of that decline on his career where 
he's not he's, it's just a case of Jim Miller just needs to get the fights in because he's just a fun fight you know he's just a fun guy to watch but I don't see J Jim turning things around really and um, that's what I see Jim Miller as now yeah gatekeeper he is literally a gatekeeper yeah. in that division um and Ronaldo is a guy that if you get the call to go and face that guy in Brazil you know what you're going to get it's going to be tough he's a name down in Brazil um Miller came out really, really quick, thought he did really well, but then the pace of Ronaldo and the, kind of the overall strength kind of came into it and he, he started to beat on a game Jim Miller. Miller's great to watch because he always brings it, he never never backs up and he tries to win the fight till the, the very last second, but Ronaldo's just a hard out for anybody uh, in that 155 division. If you, I can, like, if, I know that fighters very rarely turn down fights, but if, I got that sent my way. I don't think, but saying that Kevin Lee, it's like if you if you're a real fighter, you have to take on challenges like this. And like Jim Miller did that, and Kevin Lee did that. So uh, I like watching Ronaldo fight. He's just a he always puts on a fun, exciting scrap. Um, and he, I'm sure I think there's a an event in Brazil early in the new year. So I'm guessing we'll see him in that crowd as well, and uh, we'll see where he goes. But yeah, I think he's literally going to be one of those guys that's. In your top twenty, but will never be a top fifteen guy. Yeah, he just he'll just keep falling short against the higher higher skilled guys. So just a, just a little bit. They got a little bit more than he has. Um, fight which was another fantastic matchup. Pedro Munoz against Rob Font again. That was a great matchup, great matchmaking, and it turned out to be uh, pretty much a, a great four minutes. <laughs> Uh, pretty much like my love, my sex life. But like, it was fantastic though. Uh, Pedro Munoz clipping Rob Font and then gripping that neck when Rob Font went for a a dazed takedown. I want to call it because obviously he got clipped. He was wobbled. He had to do. He wanted to grapple. Silly little thing just went in for a, a not a very good takedown attempt. Munoz whipped that neck and just cinched it in. Did a Luke Rockhold style s one arm choke, mounted and got the win. It was beautiful watch because to be fair, Rob Font had the the better of the exchange at the start, and then Munoz kind of just started to really quickly got the timing down to get in that and close that distance and land that hook. Man, it was it was fun to watch. You know, I, I know it wasn't long, but it was good to watch. Yeah, four minutes. You're you're having a laugh there. Four minutes. Have fucking half of that. It's like two, is it not? So. Yeah, uh, half it's about yeah. kissings and cuddles <laughs> and stuff like that, you know, and, and, and begging, you know. Yeah, no, like you were saying, it was a really good fight, good match. I like matches like that, number 12 versus number 13. Um, I didn't expect Munoz to really come out like and put a really a heart on Font on the feet. I thought it'd be, I just thought that Font would be a little bit longer, a little bit quicker, um, but he put a beating on him on the feet. And then, like, like we've seen in the past, if this guy gets a hold of your neck, you're done. Literally, if he's got anything around your neck, you're in trouble. And you can see that was a vicious, vicious choke because he turned on, he was on the full mount with the submission in. And I, it's always really gruesome to see like the fighters tapping out with their feet. It's something that I get, I watch all the time, like, oh, that must be bad. That must be like a really cinched in submission. Um, but he's moving himself on. He's probably going to be a top 10 fighter in one of the most talented divisions in the UFC and he's going to get himself a big opponent. Under, under, kind of underestimating, I've underestimated that guy a little bit. I think a lot of other people do too. I know he's a talented guy, but um, he always keeps up in me. I think it's maybe because, again, Stasiak, he didn't really show what he's about. Last night he showed what he's about and when, when he shows up like that, I think he could beat some bigger names in that division. So, interesting to see who the match I'm with next. I think if, let's say if Sterling wins, in uh, December, Munoz v Sterling. Um, there's so many good fights you can put him within there. Though. So a uh, big win for him against a, a ranked guy. And he's going to push himself into that top 10 of the UFC bantamweight division. He will indeed, mate. He will indeed. Uh, next up was a fight with the best smack talker in the UFC at the moment against the most polite and just, just beautifully spoken man in the UFC like he is so nice about everyone he's just a gentleman all the time so he had Colby Covington against Damian Meyer and 
uh, we spoke off air about this, and I'll, I'll mention it again here, buddy. So, Kobe got the decision win, uh, but he was getting lit up in that first round by Damian Meyer. And I did not even say that incorrectly, people. I said Damian Meyer outstruck Colby Covington. Never going to hear that in your life, people. He was outstriking him. Um, and you could see Colby actually got, was tired. You know, he was really drained. Um, and Damian Meyer as well was tired as well from the from the output because Damian Meyer doesn't really ever throw that many punches in his life. Uh, I think that's probably the most ever thrown in a fight. Um, but what, one thing that stuck out to me was Damian Meyer got tired and Kobe was able to Kobe was able to take advantage of it. He wasn't doing great. I, I know he was landing more in the second round and the third round it wasn't so great, but it was only because Damian Meyer was tiring that much that Kobe was landing more, but there wasn't great technical ability in the striking. Like Kobe's striking was pretty, pretty poor standard. Like he would get lit up by a handful of guys in that well away top 10 if they got a chance to squ square off with him. They would light him up like a Christmas tree. Like Usman has got way better striking than that. You've got Jorge Masvidal would batter him. Uh, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, absolute light him up. There, there's so many guys in there that would just crush him with that strike. And he was overextending with the punches. They weren't clean. It was just pretty, I wasn't impressed at all. But I did say about Damien Meyer was, I think the reason one of the things was him tiring. He's not 29 years old now. So you can't do fight camp, fight camp, fight camp, one after another. He's hitting that 40 and being 40 odd years old, 40 years old, no matter how good you are, no matter how fit you are, no matter how much you train, if you've been competing for as long as he has, to do this year, he did fight straight to another fight to a five rounder, five round championship fight, then straight from that, out of that fight to another fight camp to fight this fight. That's a lot to ask of a guy who I believe that if you had given him maybe another two more months for this fight, would have had a bit more time to like rest, recover, recuperate, and then get back into it. I think you would have seen a whole different performance from Damian Meyer. And I think that's a big factor that played into it, which probably wasn't talked about in the commentary or anything like that. But I think we would have had a different result as well. But again, I think that was what, what played a factor in. Colby can have those fights, fight camp after fight camp at his age, because he's just... He's, he's younger. He, he's not had as had as much wars or damages or weight cuts, for example. Like it's a big, it's a it's a big factor to take into account, bro. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's one of these. Like I was tweeting last night. Like uh, if there's any MMA gods out there that um, Damian Meyer will choke out Colby Covington. And the thing is, I've met Colby. I met him two years ago. Him and Jorge Masvidal in Las Vegas, and he's he was actually a really nice guy. But I just, I'm not, I, I really, I don't know why I'm pissed off. Uh, not even pissed off, just, I just don't like seeing it. But I'm a Conor McGregor fan, so I don't know why. I just don't think I like his kind of approach or the way he kind of puts it out there. I mean, the one thing with Conor McGregor is you don't see him like disrespecting a country and fans. And hey, I know it gets eyeballs on you. Um, but mate, you have to, like, you won the fight, you beat the hometown guy. At least show him some respect there because he is a legit really nice guy he's a guy that would never say anything bad about you at all you won the fight you, you showed that uh, you can mix it with the elite guys in that division thought he had a terrible first round and there was judges that gave him that first round i don't understand how you could give him that first round in all honesty he took maya caught him up the nasty cut above the eye cut him with numerous shots but just maya's got he hasn't got the gas tank to to stick around any more than seven minutes, eight minutes of, of a fight, um, and I'm interested to see where he kind of he goes from here because he says he wants to fight for another year or two. I think if I was the UFC, I'd maybe let him go. Go to somewhere. He's got like one that. one fight left in his contract. Yeah, just let you know, think, one more fight yeah, left in his contract. So I would yeah. let him fight it out and then let him go to Bellator and he can make some money over there and he can beat up in some guys and get some more submission uh, submissions on his record. Well, you think but, that, but look how well it's went for guys who went to do uh, yeah, that's true. Bit. That's true. It's yeah, it's one of them things. He, he could lose a couple over there, but uh, Covington, I think there's no doubt about it. Now he's 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 what I've seen to, in my last two prediction videos with him against Dong Young Kim and against Damon Myers. Like you have to show me against 
guys that have been around a long time, elite guys. So Kim, not I don't not that I don't think he's elite, but he's a tough guy with it, and he's an awkward size. And Covington really dismantled him. And then I wanted to see what's your defensive wrestling like because I know your offensive wrestling is top notch. He showed that he can stop takedowns and um, when it comes to grappling, he can maybe beat any any guys in that division. Now, I think Woodley's still a tough fight for him because Woodley throws heat with his strikes. He's got that wrestling. I don't see him taking down Woodley um, that easy. I maybe see him get them down, but I can also see Woodley potentially get them down with a blast double or something. Um, like I said to you before we, we come on here, like, I think he's put himself in a position for a title shot. I hope it doesn't come come for that. Uh, I think it's just maybe a little bit early, but he's talked himself right up there and Woodley's responding. And once you get the champion mouthing back at you, he's touched a nerve there. So that, that could be a potential opponent for Tyron Woodley going forward. Um, but it was interesting to see, like, even some of the American top team guys were calling Kobe out on, on what he was doing, like Will Brooks. Big, Bigfoot Silver. Bigfoot Silver. Um, now, Bigfoot Silver, I can see why. Will yeah, Brooks, and Will, I'm not Will being Brooks. funny. I know Bigfoot Silver's been knocked out a few times, but Kobe would have a tough time knocking him out. Yeah, you imagine pissing yeah. him off? I wouldn't piss him off. Yeah, if you're talking about your country... Um, where you're from, I can see why Bigfoot got pissed off. But Will Brooks was a little bit surprised to see that, considering that they both come from the same gym. Um, but no, I think as well with having Jorge Masvidal literally fought Maya six months ago, having someone like that in your corner, and it's something I never even thought of before the fight. That mm. that would help out a lot, and it did. I think that, that probably did help him out a lot. But Covington's put himself right there. I just want to see him. Choked, choked out, knocked out, and just kind of put back into being irrelevant again for a little while. And maybe I can start to enjoy. I actually do enjoy watching him fight, especially with his grappling, because mm. he, you can see he's got all the skills there. Um, but I just don't like the way he's kind of portraying himself and putting himself out there. But he's got to do what he's got to do, and he's put himself right in the shop window for a potential title shot uh, going forward. I hope he doesn't get it, but geez, who knows? He's, he's got the champion. Chopping at him now, so we'll see what was on with Colby Covington in 2018. Give him um, Kamara Usman. If Kamara Usman beats Emil Meek or whatever, make that match up. That's a main event match you could put in yeah. Florida. Make it make it happen. I think so too. I'd like to see that happen, man. Big time. Um, main event was the return of the dragon, Lil Temachida, who was out for a while, like we said, came against Brunson. Now, Stylistically, it was more favourable out of everyone. You could think really for Machida the face with the style that Brunson has, the aggressive movement. But Brunson was patient, timed his, well, timed his strike a bit better and just got this beautiful left hook that caught Machida off guard as well, stumbled him, rocked him, and then ground and pounded his skull into the ground. Now, the question is, it was a performance that happened is Machida maybe, like, he had, a, he had a good time off as well to recover from those beatings that he had. And you maybe, you know, kind of recharge his chin, so to speak. Did this kind of make you think maybe his chin definitely has gone? Is it like a, um, a uh, what's his name, Chuck Liddell scenario where next time he fights, you're going to see it again. You know, you're going to see him go, get hit, he's going to go down. And, would you, and do you want to see that happen? As you know, he looked in phenomenal shape. Don't get me wrong, but if, what do you do with Leo to Machida? Bron, Bron, uh, Bron said you're going to have um, Luke Rockhold be a good matchup. The pair of them are fit. They're not hurt. You could easily match them up early on at the start of the year. I think that's a great matchup myself. That's who I would probably do. I don't know. Yeah, I'll probably do that one myself. But I, even though Brunson was a smart man and called it out, I think I would do it as well. But, Will, what's your thoughts, man? Uh, I hate seeing like old guys. Well, I, I kind of well, it's hard to say. I don't like seeing kind of older fighters really get taken to the woodshed like that. I thought that this was a matchup that Chile could win, but it's obvious, like I was saying, that uh, Brunson has learned from his previous mistakes when fighting Silva. He didn't pull the trigger. He was very patient, and once he got the slightest opportunity, he went in Machida, and Machida's chin's obviously 
gone. It's obviously deteriorated a lot. He's, he's, he has taken a lot of damage against Yoel, against Rockhold. Um, and it just culminated here with Bun- Bunsen's an explosive guy. He's obviously got big power, but he's, he's got clear deficiencies in his game, but just Machida couldn't, he never got the opportunity to capitalise on that. Um, Rockhold and Brunson, I think, is the match to make, definitely. Um, nice win for Brunson. Always, when you get that marquee win against the guy who used to hold a belt in the organisation, who's fought the who's who of legendary fighters for years uh, in the UFC and before the UFC, in, in fact, um, a nice win for Derek Brunson. We'll see where he goes. Uh, a little bit disappointed for Machida. It's hard to match Machida up, I think, with guys um, in that division. So interesting to see what we'll do. Hopefully he takes... I can see him coming back quick, though. I think he was out for that long. He'll be itching to get back in there straight away and kind of resolve and get away from this fight. And it could be one of these next like year where we see him knocked out a couple more times and him sent in retirement, hopefully. So... Yeah, Brunson moving himself forward, big win, and on to pass us new for him. Yeah, I can't see Machida doing more than next 12 months. I can't see him going any further than that. Uh, let's go to the quick mention, like I said before, Bellator card that's on this weekend uh, coming up. You've got Phil Davis is fighting Leonardo Let- uh, Letty. Uh, he's, you know, Phil Davis needs to get himself back onto that track to get the light heavyweight division uh, title back. Uh, He's got himself a, an unbeaten prospect. It's going to be interesting to see how we fight in that one. You've also got, from Britain, Linton Purcell getting a stab at the title against Ryan Bader. Uh, you know, good on Linton getting a sh- shot at the title. If I'm honest, Will, if I didn't mention that, we probably wouldn't have known that Ryan Bader is defending his light heavyweight belt at Bellator. Yeah, that's, that's like literally nothing. Nothing. And that- yeah, like I know that I don't really follow too much of the Bellator side because we really we have to watch it in absolutely shitty streams at, at shitty times in the morning. Yeah. And they could, when they could, when they could, they really could put it in UK TV. There's somewhere for Bellator on UK TV. Um, yeah. But the the fight I'm kind of looking forward to. I'm looking forward to McFarlane against Emily Duco. I think that's a good fight. Phil mm. Davis, like you said, is facing an uh, undefeated guy. Ed Ruth is fighting Chris Dempsey. Former UFC Sad, guy. Sadawad is fine as yeah, well. Yeah, Sadawad. Ed Ruth against the former UFC guy in Chris Dempsey, who he talking about not having a chin. That guy's got no chin. So I can see Ed Ruth taking it, taking him down and like heavy ground and pounding that guy out. So, um, but there's nothing. There's literally nothing been said in the last two weeks. The only things that I've really seen regarding Bellator is um, James Lynch, I think, has did a couple of interviews who I always look out for his interviews and just listen in and uh, see what's going on. But uh, Bader versus Vassell, uh, I think it's a tough fight for, for Vassell because Bader's wrestling is really good and I think the striking is definitely Ryan Bader. So, but it's nice to see him get an opportunity for a belt. But uh, Paul and bring it to you. Yeah, exactly. If he does, he does bring it back. It'd be good because Lee McGeary's had it. Yeah. If Linton can grab it, that'd be cool. You know, it's it. Bellator wet light like heavyweight division actually isn't too bad to be honest with you. It's actually pretty decent. Um, uh, considering the, the the numbers they've got in there, it's it's quite. It's just a mixture of Bellator can just go. We'll just put them two together now, and they're pretty good names. So I, I credit to them on that one. Uh, but we're going to talk about the big fight, the card, the huge fight card, which is UFC two seventeen. Absolutely. Absolutely buzzing for it. Honestly, I legitimately am looking forward to this fight card. Ticket sales haven't went that well, though. Will you know it's it's not gone too it's not gone down too big in uh, New York. I don't know if it, maybe it'll change this week, but that's that's something that's uh, a bit surprising. Is this? Uh, I, I I was listening to the M maybe and they were saying that the UFC did a bit of research last year about GSP, and a lot of the fans were just there was not that much buzz about it. Yeah, they've still stuck by it with the GSP thing. And you've got to think four years, in four years, the fan turnover is huge. You know, you've got to go back quite a while, uh, four years to think about when he was fighting. For you and I, it, it wasn't that long ago, so to speak. But for new fans, there's a lot of new fans in the sport. They won't have a clue who G- George St. Pierre is. They won't have a clue. Yeah, because it's before the Conor McGregor era. Exactly. And so, Ronda Rousey. Yeah, and Ronda Rousey. So it's uh, these guys. A lot of the new fans were like, who is George St. Pierre? And he's, he's one of the most dominant UFC champions we've had 
for literally former great champions and like Matt Hughes and BJ Penn and had that built for a long time. And he was, before the end of his tenure last time out, he was struggling. Um, mm. You could see mentally he was gone. He got his ass beat, I think, was it that um, Hendricks fight? Hendricks. And it, his, his face, face. Was terrible. Um, and now he's coming back four year layoff, upper division. Uh, oh, it's well, interesting. It's, it's... Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the main event yeah. in a moment. Yeah, but it's tickets are like saying I'm doing too well. But it's, either way, there's some great fights on this card, Will. Uh, and let's start yeah. the uh, stuff on the bottom of the card and work our way up. Um, so this fight card uh, is going to start with Farasa Harvey's brother fighting, okay, um, against Ricardo Ramos. Now, Ramos is the lad who got signed up via the uh, looking for a fighter. Uh, and to be honest with you, he did look good in his debut. He did uh, have a bit of, I think, gas tank issues. I don't know if that's adrenaline, um, maybe, or, you know, kind of jitters. So I don't want to take too much out of it, to be honest with you. Uh, but he's a fun fighter. But the thing is, I think Zahab's a good fighter, man. Zahab is a really good fighter. Do you know what I mean? He's got beautiful, I think he's got good, good combinations, good entries for the grappling. I quite like him for this fight, you know. I think Ramos is a talented fighter, but Zahabi's a very good fighter. And I look, I, I've, I'm probably going to pick him on this one for myself. Yeah, I'm with you. I like, I think Zahabi, I think he took too many shots in that fight against Reginaldo Vera. I think that he started off really, really well. And Vera mm -hmm. came into the fight and he took a lot of unnecessary shots. So that's something that he has to show up a little bit. And I'm sure Zahabi, for us, will, will tighten that kind of aspect of the game up. He took too many silly shots, but Ramos is a young, young kid. There's a guy that I've known about for three years since he was like 18, 19 years old. Watched him against Manny Vasquez when people were calling for the for him to go to UFC then and lost that fight. And then he's got his opportunity. And I picked him for his last fight against uh, Tanaka. He was a huge underdog in that one, and I picked him and actually won that bet. I just think that Zahabi's he's going to be just a a little bit too good and I think that I know he's got to overcome the reach and the, and the height mm. of Ricardo Ramos but I think he can do that he's been fighting with bigger guys like your Joseph Duffy's and training with them guys so I think he's going to be too much I think he can stop Ramos as well I think Ramos is going to fade and he could potentially ground and pound him out so I, I like the hobby yeah I'm with the bro I like that decision so UFC 217 has got Corey Anderson against OSP OSP stepped in uh, to replace uh, Pat Cummins. Now, one thing about this, I was a bit naffed off with Corey Anderson's approach to this when Pat Cummins uh, announced that he was pulling out because of staph infection on his foot. I, I assume you saw the picture, Will, yourself. Yeah. It was pretty bad. It, was, it wasn't like a little bit of staph. It looked like he had an allergic reaction on his foot. Like, you know, like when Will Smith had that um, allergic reaction in the film when he had some fish in... Um, Hitch, or I think it was something like that, and his face just swelled up like Elephant Man. His foot just swelled up. I was like, how can you... I was like, that's just... That's not on, Corey, saying, oh, you've got a bit of time to... I was like, that's bang. That's his foot. I said, if it was his hand, I could maybe see, maybe, but at the same time, no. As, especially if you're Pat Cummins, you've just seen what Kevin Lee did by not declaring it, going in, you could see how it affected him. No, 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 no. Pull out, do the right thing. But anyway... Yeah, Corey Anderson, OSP. I think this is a worse matchup for Corey fighting OSP than it is Pat Cummings. Mm. I think OSP is more dangerous. I think OSP's just got a bit more in his arsenal. Corey Anderson is a young, he's a young kid still, I think, in in a sense, in, in MMA terms. Like he came to UFC pretty early on for his MMA career. And I just think OSP's just got a bit more to him in this game. He's, he's fought the higher level of guys. Both of them, you know, kind of fall short, but I just do feel that. OSP's got a bit more in him than the uh, than Corey. I know OSP won against Akami. It was a bit of a gimme fight, but even still, I'd probably pick OSP for this one, and I would not be surprised if OSP gets a, a submission. Yeah, I think under Corey Anderson could be live in this fight. I think he could win. I don't know. Sometimes OSP just flattens to deceive with me a little bit, and sometimes he just doesn't show up. Like there used to be a fight, he did not show up at all. Um, the man of a fight, he did not show up at all. And um, 
he has come back. He beat the uh, Peugeot and he beat Okami. But uh, I think Corey Anderson has an opportunity if it gets late into the fight. But I think that OSP can stop the takedowns. And I think on the feet, Anderson's not that good on the feet. And OSP should be better there. Um, he, I think Anderson needs to get it to the ground. But once you go to the ground with OSP, then you're, you're, you're just going to struggle with that guy because he can find awkward jokes, um, awkward position, just a big guy you kind of have on top of you. So I'm going to go with OSP, but it would not surprise me in the slightest if Corey Anderson got the victory here. I think he's going to be a huge underdog as well, but OSP I'll pick just. I don't know what the betting lines are yet, brother, but then let's go with Curtis Blades against, I think, the, the kind of surprise heavyweight, I think, I want to call him, uh, the bow constrictor. Uh, Alexi, he's surprised me in the way he's performed in the UFC. I, I, I didn't, I don't know if it's just because of, I took a, I took him a bit for granted because he had a lot of rec fights on his record. When you look at his record, how they were, like three or four fights on a night and stuff like that, I was a bit dubious, but dude is legit and he's performed fine. I've been really impressed. Uh, he beat Travis Brown last. Now, how much you take out of that, I don't know. But what's your thoughts on this fight? I I think I picked against the Linux quite a lot. I, I think I even picked Travis Brown, which is really bad pick on my on my, on my side but I think he's got this like crazy crazy strength and find submissions from literally everywhere if he's on his back against Victor Pesta he's catching an Ezekiel choke if against Travis Brown it was a, I think it was a neck crank or something like that the guy's got like 40 submissions by I think I think by like Ezekiel choke or something so it's crazy crazy uh, grappling skills this guy has Curtis Blades is one of the guy, one of those guys that can either like be really, really good, like he was against Adam Mid Milstead, where he was throwing him around like really badly, and then he just uh, the fight against Daniel Olmelanchuk was so bad to watch. But he has the potential to literally throw a Linux around. So I think if he gets through the first round and is, is not put in a position where Olenek can get a, a submission, I think that he will garner takedowns and. Uh, Blades is more definitely the more athletic guy here, so I think on the feet he's definitely going to be better too. I'm going to pick Curtis Blades, but just watch Alex Lennox go and catch a, like a submission from the weirdest angle, weirdest position you've ever seen in your life here, but I feel more confident picking Curtis Blades. Yeah, Curtis definitely got good hands, got good finishes on the feet, um, but he's fighting a vet, he's fighting a very smart veteran, so like you said, I think flying triangle, something like that, uh, <laughs> it's it's a hard pick. I'm gonna go against. I'm gonna go with. The, I'm gonna go with the Russian. I don't know what it is, but I've got to pick him. I, I've I've picked against him <laughs> too many times. I, I've got to pick him. I, I feel bad. Uh, so yeah, and this fight next one up, man. It is Randy Brown against Mickey Gall. Now Mickey Gall has had the best UFC career you could have. You've had gimme gimme fights apart from the Sage Na Sage Northcott, which was his most interesting fight he could had. And he passed that with flying colours. I think I wasn't surprised to be honest with you because Sage just still doesn't have that ground game. Uh but now he's finally got a test. I truly believe that now he's he can't get any more gimme fights in the UFC. It's to, to the point now where he has to fight real challenges in the welterweight division. And he's got Ron Randy Brown who's in my eyes, a kind of ideal situation. He's probably like the one of the ideal welterweights, lower ranked guys that you can give him. But I think it's going to be a tough, tough outing for Mickey Gall. I think Rick, uh, Randy Brown's got some good striking. He trains with Andre, uh, Andre Harrison, who is a champion in his own right, a, a legit fighter. I think Randy Brown's stand up is going to catch Mickey Gall here, and I think we're going to have to see a good fight. But I'm going to go with Randy here. Yeah, I'm going to go for Randy as well. I think that. I mean, Mickey Gall's beat a reporter, he's beat a pro wrestler, and he's pretty much beat like a poster boy. And that's pretty much it. Uh, I don't think the, the winning in Sage Northcott's a bad one. I think it's pretty decent having a record, but Sage isn't, he's not really tough. Uh, and you can break him if you hit him with the right shots. He's, he's, a, he's a playboy pretty much of the UFCs. Um, all he is is kind of about his looks. He, he can fight, but uh, I don't really... I don't. I just think this is going to be a bad fight for Mickey Gall here. We haven't seen him in a 
a long time as well, like 10, 11 months. So I think Randy Brown uh, is a really, I think he's a shoo-in to win this fight. As long as he, he does not get put in the ground, I think he will literally beat up um, Mickey Gall in the feet. And uh, I mean, he's fought good guys. I mean, Bilal Muhammad's a tough guy. And, yeah. Um, and Mike Graves, who he lost to, that there's two guys that are really, really tough uh, opponents. I just think that Randy Brown's going to be a better overall fighter. I think as long as he does not get put in his back, he wins this fight nine out of ten times. Uh, next fight up, bro, is a fight I don't see it being a free rounder. I think someone might be going to sleep. Uh, you've got, oh gosh, here we go. Ion Kutulaba against Michael <clears throat> Olesh. So, how do you see this one going, Will? Yeah, I, um, I like Kutulaba. I think this is one of, definitely my, one of the most confident picks on the card. He's coming in here, uh, I'm going to call him Michael. I'm not that great with this name either. Haven't really heard too much of it. So, um, fighting out of Poland is actually a guy I've never really heard of either. And uh, I know that he fought, um, he's fought in some of the kind of Polish regional scene, but he's coming in here short notice. I think Anti Gulov against Kutalaba was going to be a great fight. I think Kutalaba is just really fun to watch. He's like fireworks. He's mean mugging you from the get go. He's throwing heavy leather. He can throw you around like a rag doll. And he's a young guy as well. He's only like 23 years old. Yeah, I'm really, super young. Yeah. Yeah. Both, both of them are. The good thing yeah. is, both of these guys are actually as well. I think he's. Yeah. yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing how they, they match up Kutilaba. This is a fight I think he can look great in the big lights in New York, on the, the prelims, on Fox Sports 1. And uh, this is a shine spot for him. I expect him to smash his opponent here and win. I think he can finish this in the first round as well. I think one of the reasons why they signed him as well as Michael is because being Polish, the Polish contingent in New York as well. I think that's one of the reasons why they signed him on. Uh, so it's going to be. And next up, we have British uh, fighter on the card. Uh, one of the uh, British fighters, you've got uh, Mark Godbeer fighting Walt Harris in heavyweight bout, which was meant to happen on the last card. But remember last time on the UFC 216 card where it went upside down, inside out, and all the fights got changed. Uh, that's happened, it's rescheduled. Um, we, we were both picking uh, Walt Harris on this one. Ideally, we'd like Mark to win, but the odds are it's probably going to be Walt Harris getting the victory here uh, just because of, I think, range, athleticism, just being a big factor in this one, um, just picking Mark off. Uh, but let's let, let's see what you've got to say, bro. Nothing changes from when we're breaking down UFC 216. Walt Harris really... Doesn't win that fight to for Victor Vadim because Vadim's a former champion. He's one of the greatest heavyweights of all time. Stepping up there in like three hours notice um, for a big opportunity. Mark, I'm really happy that Mark's getting an opportunity to fight in another big card and another big stage, big arena in New York. Um, that's that's pretty something nice to kind of tell the grandkids. Same like I fought in MSG, um, which is one of the, the most biggest arenas in the world, if not the biggest arena in the world. Um, Walt Harris, I think he's too athletic. Eventually, he'll catch Mark with a shot, and uh, I can see him putting him down. But I think if it goes in late, Mark could come into the fight, like I, I thought beforehand. But the pick's going to be Walt Harris. Uh, next up is a fight which I think anyone who is an admirer of the lightweight division is going to be super jacked for this fight, Will. This is sick. Joseph Duffy against James Vick. Ah, just filthy, filthy fight. I think James Duffy, though, has really got to be on point from the get-go because James Vick is an aggressive, come-in-your-face fighter. Like, I'll rephrase that. Uh, <laughs> punching you from the get-go kind of fighter. <laughs> he is. He's, he's a violent guy. He likes to come and bring a fight to you. He doesn't like to... <laughs> he doesn't like to stand back. He's he's a very good fighter, though, James Vick. He's tall for 155. Six three, he's a long guy. Joe Duffy has to be on point against this guy. I, I don't know if he wants to take a note out of the Belial Muhammad fight, maybe, uh, and maybe take off from some from there. But Joe Duffy needs to put on a hell of a performance here to to get past Joe uh, James Vick. Yeah, people people underestimate James Vick, and I think even like the UFC have. I think I watched the watch list for UFC two seventeen today, and Sean Shelby was like, "How did I not see see this guy coming through?" Which is crazy considering this guy was an ultimate fighter like 
three, four years ago, maybe even longer than that. Um, and he's a really, really solid guy. I'm really struggling with the matchup because I like both guys. Um, and I, so, I mean, this is, the thing that I don't like with this is James makes like a huge weight cut for this division. I've seen him at UFC 197 where he looked, he didn't look great, but he was the complete ultimate professional, made weight, uh, had a decent performance against Clayco Franca, and he's just, he's turned into a really solid pro, loved his fight with Abel Trujillo, beat him up in the feet and then caught with a dash choke, and then he knocked out Polo Reyes with a, a beautiful straight down the pipe. Joseph Duffy's a guy that, we, I don't think we see, just don't see enough of this guy. I love to see him fight every four, five, six months or so. Um, because he's such a solid professional, great boxing skills, uh, underrated um, grappling. I think since that loss to Pori, he's shown that he can grapple a little bit more. He's got dangerous submissions. But he has beat Mitch Clark and he, he's, he has beat Razor Madadi. Both guys, are, I think, they're pretty much retired now. So it's like, I'm finding it tough to pick. I, I think Joe's, he can catch, he can catch James Vick, but I can also see James Vick catching Joseph Duffy, but I think I'm going to edge with James Vick. I, I, I would like a Duffy win for the simple fact that I think he'd bring good fights to Ireland in a main event, and a potential like ranked guy over there in Dublin would be a great fight. I've just got the feeling James Vick's going to do the do the, uh, do the job here, um, but I think it's going to be really, really close. I'm going to go 29-28 for James Vick. I'm just slightly edging James as well. I, it, it's not a lot, but I yeah. just slight bit as well. I, I, yeah. I've got a here as well. We've done that one. Uh, kicking off the main card is, I believe, what I want to call a gimme fight, uh, and which sounds bananas, but hear me out. Uh, Paolo, oh my gosh, Boccaracina. Boccaracina uh, is fighting Johnny Hendricks. I don't see much in Johnny Hendricks. I don't see, the, I don't see it in him anymore. I don't see that. I've got to win this fight. I've got to win the title. I've got to do that. I've, I've, I've got to be reaching for these goals. I just see a guy just kind of going through the motions against a guy, a kid, coming up. He's a monster at 185. He, he, what I mean by that is he's just violent. He swings. Now, I don't see him, uh, Paulo, as a, like a, a, a middleweight champ, but I see him as a guy who is going to put the hurting on Johnny Hendricks. Look what Kelvin Gaslin did. Just lit him up, just strike him, just light him up. I see Paulo just doing exactly the same thing here, just lining him up, but actually probably finishing him. Yeah. I'm a little bit weary of this fight, and I, I don't know what if I should be, because Johnny Hendricks, I think, is done. I, I really do. I think he's... This is the fight. UFC have matched this, not for Johnny Hendricks' sake, it's for Paulo Boricina. They, they, they've got someone who they could potentially build into being a star in the 185 pound division so they're, they're putting him in there with um, a former champion he beats this guy he gets all the kind of eyeballs on him in the first round he's going to come out strong he's going to look to take his head off but if this fight hits the second round i see hendrix could tough it out and he does have that rest within his back pocket in that fight with bambozi he got taken down now bambozi is not a great fighter but bambozi took boishina down now i know he's probably a little bit reckless with his his attacks and so on. Um, I think the right, what I want to see is Boroshina win because we need more guys coming through. And Johnny Hendricks, I mean, moving to Winkle Johns, Jackson Winkle Johns, this, it's too late. Too late. It, it's, you should, if you wanted to go to a, a, a high class gym, you should have did that a few years ago. Now you're just doing it for the sake of it. And, um, uh, I'm going to go Paolo Boroshina, but it wouldn't surprise me if this fight goes into two and three and Johnny Hendricks starts getting takedowns. But I want to see Paolo Boroshina win. Yeah, I'm going with Paolo as well. Uh, going for first round, uh, just starching Johnny Hendricks. Uh, next up is a a fight which it just can't disappoint. Jorge Masvidal against Stephen Thompson. Uh, one fact that will be taken into account with this fight, mate, is the big cage. They'll be using the big cage for this event which is ideal for Stephen Thompson, less ideal for Jorge Masvidal, because Jorge Masvidal will want to close that gap down, want to get in the face. And they've only got three rounds, so if Stephen Wonderboy Thompson can get on his back foot, get that footwork moving, he could possibly get himself a nice decision win here. If 
um, if he can keep the space and just keep just getting the points, you know, points win. You know, not 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 trying to get the finish, but just out point Jorge. Because Jorge's, you know, the kind of guy who would just walk forward to try and get the exchanges in. He might be trying to get that down. So I'll be interested to see how Jorge handles the kind of footwork and, and the movement that Stephen Wonderboy Thompson offers. I'm more inclined to say Jorge will win. Um, just because of the wars that Stephen Thompson had with Woodley. Like, damn. So, like, wow, that was a hell of a scrap. Um, and Jorge's just tough as coffin. I, like, I, I want to favour Jorge, though, because I somehow think he's suave and smart, and I think he can get just figure it out and get this done. Mm. Massive Dahl's just smooth. He's su such a smooth... Um, smooth fighter in all aspects. One of the most, I think, underrated guys in the whole entire sport. Um, really solid fighter. Beautiful, beautiful boxing. Just everywhere. He's so solid everywhere. And since he's uh, kind of opened his mouth a little bit more in the UFC, you starting to see him come through. And I mean, he knocked out Cerrone earlier on the year with some beautiful strikes. And uh, with Maya, I thought he gave a great account of himself, even though he lost that fight. Um, showed that he could stick around with a guy literally backpacking you probably the guy you don't want backpacking you for 15 minutes and uh, doing kind of good with that but this is the fight to me that just screams point fighting and Stephen Wonderboy Thompson is a great great point fighter um, like you said I never even thought of the big cage that's a big aspect where he could um, literally he could be it's just it's a, one of those style matchups that it's really really hard to, to really look good against. I think that Masvidal has to start really quick and he needs to win the first round. If he if he does not win the first round, I don't see him winning this fight because I can see that means he has to get more aggressive and that means that uh, Thompson can move around and pick his shots and look better in the judges' eyes. So I'm going to go Wonderboy via, via a close 29-28 decision. But um, it's a tough fight to call. I, I, just, I think I like Wonderboy a little bit more at this point. Yeah, super tough fight, mate. It's it's a beautiful matchup, though. Absolutely fantastic, well to matchup to make. Uh, then we're going to go to the championship fights where, oh, Joanna Tatejak is back, and whenever she's back, I'm happy. Uh, she's fighting Rose Amelinez, uh, mate. I've we set off there. You give me a break. I'm picking JJ because she's just a violent son of a bitch, <laughs> um, but. Give us your breakdown on why you think uh, you believe the winner will be JJ. JJ, I cannot see losing this fight. I think out of all the championship fights she's had, I think this is the easiest one that she's had, personally. Uh, maybe it's uh, Laterno. I'd say that Laterno did land some strikes, but I think this is potentially the easiest one that she's had for the simple reason. Jessica Penny? Uh, did I say Penny? If I let Laterno. No, 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 no. You, said, you said Laterno, but it's not, it's not Penny, is it? I, thought, I totally forgot about Penny as well. So Penny and Laterno, I think I think she's mentally in Nama Yunus's head already. I think that Nama Yunus, um, she has to be all there mentally to to look good. I think against Van Zandt she did that, against Watson she did that. I think that Ndjicic will, will eat her up. Saying that, Nami Yunus is bringing some new stuff to the table here. She's got a, 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 probably the best kicking game that Joanna's ever seen. She's got she can be really really like she can throw up wild submissions that she's she's never faced. Like I know we had Gadelia who is more of your uh, kind of old school jiu jitsu um, where Nami Yunus can throw flying arm bars and triangles and so on. Not that we've seen that much of it in the UFC, but she still has that in her back pocket if she needs it. I just think Joanna is going to eat Rose Namajunas up for breakfast from the get-go. I don't think Rose can take her down. If Claudia Gadelia cannot take you down and Andrade can't take you down, Rose Namajunas can't do that. So that means it comes to striking battle. And in a striking battle, I will always favour someone who is very quick, is brutal with her strikes, never stops, um, and it's just tenacious as fuck. I mean, she's so tenacious. She's she's in your face. She's throwing leather. She takes, to be fair, she takes some shots as well. The Andrade fight, uh, um, or whatever fight, uh, Kovalkiewicz, her nose was blown up a little bit. The Andrade fight, she, she took some took some hits, but she still won those fights very very comfortably. I think that she 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 will just. I think she stops her. I think she stops her with the strikes, kind of like the Penny fight 
Mm. Third, third round, fourth round, I think they're just going to accumulate. And I think that Rose is just going to check out and just go go in a merry way. So, uh, Joanna Champion via violent, violent finish in the middle of the, the middle, middle to late rounds of this fight. And next up is a fight that you are slightly excited about. Uh, Cody No Love Garbrandt against TJ Dillashaw. Uh, the Bantamweight title is on the line. Uh, Cody's been out for a little bit of uh, time with the back injury. He had surgery, went to Germany, all that jazz. He is better. He's on point. He's feeling good. Uh, TJ Dillashaw trying to rekindle his... Uh, fired to get that championship back in this matchup. There's the history with Team Alpha Male, with TJ going, and the rumours that uh, TJ is the reason why uh, Holdsworth is uh, retired. And God, there's all sorts of stuff. There's, there's so much of a backstory that you could just look at that alone without even looking at the fighters themselves and the techniques and the methods they have. Uh, it's going to be a classic. I already get a feeling it's going to be a great fight. I am favouring Cody myself. Uh, I do think that with that, he's got the power in those hands that I think will put um, TJ, I think it'll put him on his ass. I'm not saying he's going to knock TJ out. So I think TJ's conditioning is one thing to take into account. Having great conditioning can make your recovery a lot better, so I think it'll help him take the hit. But I think it'll put him on his ass so much that it will not break TJ, but it will throw to TJ off his rhythm so much that it will have an effect on his overall performance. Uh, but what's your thoughts on the fight and how do you see it going down? Uh, it's such a good fight. Even though I am a fan, a huge fan of Cody Garbrandt, I just love the fight in itself. There's so much um, backlog with the fight. There's obviously things we've been on years ago. Cody got brought in. TJ, I don't think, like that. There's this whole thing of Cody knocking TJ out or knocking him down and sparring, um, which Justin Buckholz says he has the, the footage of that. And then obviously Cody uh, TJ leaving. They were on the show together. Um, then the fight got cancelled and then they've moved here. And uh, it's such a good, good fight. And I think this is going to be one of those fights that's, I think they could, either one could take it to the ground, but I think it's going to be predominantly a striking battle and the quicker. Uh, more precise striker is going to come out on top. Now you've got TJ who's striking is decent, very, very, very good footwork. Like it, since people talk about him going to Dwayne Lovebig and change, he, he's totally changed from Team Alpha Male. When you when you see him in the Ultimate Fighter come out of there, he was predominantly a grappler, and then you see him as a striker against Henry Brown with that beautiful footwork, and um, that's something that's incorporated into his game and looks really good with it. I think that. If they start exchanging and Cody lands, Cody can put him down. Like you say, maybe not knock him out, but I think he is the slightly faster fighter with the faster hands. And I do think he has the better boxing. I don't think overall striking, maybe that goes to TJ. I think he uses kicks a little bit better. But I think when it comes to boxing, which I think this fight could predominantly be, I think that Cody is the better striker and the better boxer. Um, and and I think he can mix it up. I think he can take down TJ. He's I think he has the better wrestler as well. Um, but it's such a such a good. I'm really looking forward to just sitting back and watch it. Uh, I'm picking Cody. I'm hoping Cody wins. I'm a huge fan. Um, met the guy and he's he's he was such a cool dude to me and his family were so nice to me as well when I met them out there. And uh, yeah, just thoroughly looking forward to the fight. I haven't won a decision. Like a 48, 47, or 46, 49. Um, but it's a great grudge match. I love I love fights like this and two talented guys that um, are going to just got to meet head on and we're going to see who the best in the division is. I think it's a fight of two of the best because the Cruz, TJ, TJ, and then there's Garbrandt. They're the three guys in that division. Mm. And I just think that Cody is the guy at the minute with the all around game that can win and be a guy that stays in that. A champion of that division for a little while. Yeah, absolutely fascinating fight. Uh, and then then we have, I kind of want to call it a marquee fight, but it's it's a little weight title fight. Um, Michael Bisping, George St. Pierre. I say marquee fight because you've got George St. Pierre, who's been out for four years, comes back, gets a title fight in a weight class, he's not fought in. He's got up a weight class against George, uh, uh, Michael Bisping. And Michael Bisping as well. 
he won a title against a legit guy in Luke Rockhold, but then he's defended against Dan Henderson, and now he's getting George St. Pierre. I don't want to say they're not the most, I don't want to say gimme fights, but they're the easier defenses that you probably ever find in modern day UFC history. Uh, I think you're the same. We're both probably going to pick Michael Bisping, I, I believe, uh, as well, the, because Bisping, he is going to be a lot bigger, a lot bigger. And, and size, it comes to the point where skill and size does benefit and outweigh a lot of things. So skill set wise, you know Michael Bisping is a very skilled fighter, very good striker. But, and his takedown defenses went up tenfold since maybe the, um, especially since the uh, Tim Kennedy fight. You know, he, he's, his takedown defenses improved dramatically. So then you've got to think, then it starts to balance out. But then the size starts to take over. Can George take a punch that well? Well, he was getting lit up four years ago uh, in his last few fights. He's taken the most, he's taken a ridiculous amount of strikes in title fights as well, George St. Pierre. So he's hittable against guys. Will he take a punch against Michael Bisping that well? I don't think so. I, I legitimately I legitimately do not see this going all the way five rounds. I see jo Michael Bisping stopping George St. Pierre with strikes. I, I, I honestly do. I see like a, a TKO where he, he knocks George down and just finishes him with like a flurry. Mm. It's a fight that I've really not been invested in all that much, but then the course, like I thought, I actually didn't think I would get invested in it at all, but the, like I said before, it's the closer it's got, the more I'm kind of getting intrigued by it. Um, I can't pick George St. Pierre. I just can't do it after being away for so long. Um, I, I think he's coming back here because you think this is the easiest fight you can get. Michael Bisman's got a belt as well, so if he wins this fight, he's going to he's going to put himself out there as one of the best champions of all time. And he is already one of the best champions of all time. Let's not get it twisted, but Bisman's going to be huge. Bigger. I think it's going to be a big, big difference when you, when you see these guys before the fights start. This one's going to be, he, he will be weighing what? 2? 10, 215 ish. Yeah, about 210, about 210, yeah. It's going to be huge. Uh, GSP's not going to be nowhere on the other. What was GSP really known for as a fighter? Just being an all around, very athletic, good fighter, great wrestling, great timing, mixed it up really well. Um, like we were saying before, George St. Pierre's been around. Like the Connor fans weren't, weren't here then, the Ronda fans weren't here then. So people are asking, like asking, who's George St. Pierre, some of these new fans, um, and why is he in the main event? I've actually seen people say, why is this guy main event and coming back after four years? And then they have to really go back and just watch five, six years of fights of George St. Pierre when he was one of the best guys to ever come in and uh, fight in the UFC. But I just think this one's going to be too big. And um, a bit too physical. I just don't see GSP taking him down and keeping him there. Bisbin will, Bisbin's underrated. Bisbin's always been underrated. Um, but if he wins this fight, I mean, he's beat Dan Henderson. He's beaten Anderson Silva. He's beaten George St. Pierre. He's beaten legit guys Luke Rockhold. Um, I'm not his biggest fan, but I think this is a great, great spot for him to put himself out there against George St. Pierre and get a win against him. Um, I like him. I think I'm not as confident as you is stopping him. Um, it'd be pretty cool to see that, to be honest with you. But I think I, I'll go a decision for Bisbane, but I, I just can't pick GSP. Yeah, it's it's one I can't do either. And um, I, 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 and Bisbane said as well. He said he'll definitely fight one more time after this. Well, it's going to have to be Whitaker. I don't think that's a good matchup for him. Yeah, I don't see him doing it. I, I legitimately don't. I just think no. Yeah. Beat GSP, say, so, right, do you know what? I'm done. I'm all right. I've had a couple of defences. Happy day. See you later. I'm off into sunset. Because, um, to be honest with you, you won't get a big... It, this pay-per-view will probably be the bigger one he'll, he'll get. Because, obviously, if he fights again, he'll be the main event. And I can't see him getting more ticket sales, uh, more pay-per-view buys than this. Because you'll get the guys who did follow GSP and they will probably buy the pay-per-view to watch it, especially Canada and stuff. So, uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, that's, that's the UFC... 270 card. We're going to go to your questions now, ladies and gentlemen, which we always get and we love. So thank you very much. Uh, on Saturday, I posted a tweet about uh, for both cards, Cage Warriors and the uh, Sao Paulo cards. We've got a few questions here, Will. Uh, so from uh, one of your favourite guys, uh, Will, um, uh, Fred B on Twitter or FB20152. 
Uh, he said here, do you believe Paddy is coming back early next year? And if so, will Cage Warriors give him an easy comeback fight? Well, odds are he's probably going to do 155. He'll probably fight in this, uh, this Liverpool card in February, in my opinion. Easy fight. Um, they've got guys in that division that they can match him up with already. So I think it would be... I don't know about easy matchups because I don't think he'll have an easy matchup now because 155 is not a, a place to mix, mess around with. I think he'll have a fight. He'll have a real fight on his hands when he comes on February card. Yeah, I'm with you there. 155 is the place he's going to go. He he will main event that Liverpool card if he can stay healthy. Um, and the right thing to do is move up now. Maybe him against Soren back as a main event. It's a great fight. It really is a good fight. So it would be. Yeah. Um, I don't. Cage Warriors don't really. People, I've seen people say like with Lou Long that he remember he was against Soldic. That I've seen, I've seen people online saying that that was an easy fight for Lou. Didn't turn out to be like that. Cage Warriors does not give you softballs. They they, they try and find the best guys in Europe to to face. They try and put the best against the best. Um, so I that's a fight I would like to see. I like to see Paddy against Back. I think that'd be on the ground. I think it'd be a great fight down mm -hmm. there. So. Um, wouldn't I think it'd be a great main event? Maybe for the vacant 155 title, if Fishbowl does give it up. Ah, no, that's actually don't don't do it for a belt. That's stupid. But I think they should make that as a main event at least. Yeah, maybe the the winner gets a, a shot at the title. Yeah, maybe yeah. Yeah, yeah, that would be a good one. Uh, next one we had here was from Benjamin Berry. Yeah, his Twitter handle is at I Ben Berry. Uh, he asked a question here. Well. Uh, do you believe Victor Cheng was robbed of a title because the fight wasn't in his hometown? Mm, it's always a, it, it can always happen if you're fighting in an opponent's hometown. It, I could say you have the crowd on your side, which can influence judges. Um, I like I always think, like I said to you beforehand, it was like if you go to different parts of the country, would he get that decision? Possibly. I think he could if it was in Manchester. He could put Victor Chain could be walking away with the belt instead of um, his opponent there. So it's just, I think it's a it's a valid reason what what he's asking, valid question that he's asking there. Um, do I think it was a little bit maybe, but it was a close fight. So who might say? Uh, it was a close fight and again. It's that, those moments when shots that looked like they landed but didn't land it, but the crowd cheers yeah. can always. It certainly probably possibly does play a factor, um, especially if a judge is not sure if it landed, but the crowd reacts in a way that makes you think, oh, it probably did land because they've they're going bananas for it. Uh, next up, we have here uh, a scouser asking the question arcade like uh, Chris uh, Chris Margerson asking a question. His Twitter handle is at c mar j e sin twenty four. Uh, he asks question for the next podcast: Would a fighter Rather be a champion and go down as a legend, but only earn enough to live on, or never enter into the top ten but earn a million a fight. Ooh, tough one. I think like if I if I was to be a fighter, I would want to be a champion and be a legend through that, and just like be. But then, uh, yeah, I can see where he's coming from with. If you could be like a fighter that just shoots his mouth off and like wins fights but gets paid very very well, then that would be that'd be good too. But for me, if I had if I was a fighter, I would want to be the best and want to get that strap and put myself as one of the best that's ever ever did it. Because I think that ultimately what the sport is about is finding who the best fighter is across multiple disciplines of um, and seeing just who the best guy is. I know if I was a fighter, I would probably want to be the champion like. Like a GSP or an Anderson Silva, who had the belt for years, had a long. That's what they're going to be, like. GSP could lose this fight next week, but nobody's really going to care because he's got that legacy behind him already. G uh, Anderson Silva's the same. Now it does taint your legacy a little bit, but that legacy is intact during that period of time. You were the best fighter, and you beat the best guys, and you were the best that you could be. And he made things with GSP. He did that. He was the best fighter, but he also made a shit ton of money. He was one of the yeah, most fucking he's some, huge. He's got some huge sponsors. He still has them with Under Armour and so on. Hayabusa as well. Yeah, Hayabusa. So he's he's got some legit sponsors out there, and he he's set for life, and he's going to go down as one of the best champions in this young sport. So 
So yeah, it's a tough one. Yeah, I think it, if you're from a purist perspective, if you get into the sport for that reason, like, like when I compete, I, I just wanted to I wanted to make a, a legacy in some way. When I first started, I went I wanted to be I want to do something and create something, and and I've done stuff like that, you know. So, and I'm happy for that, but. It's not about if it's about the money, you'll never probably be the best because your incentive isn't there. So it's it's a it's a flip a flip of the coin one. Uh, the next question we have here is from Adam Sean, a boy Adam, as uh, Twitter handle at Adam Sean two nine two. So we asked the question here. So uh, where, where where is that one? Here it is. I'll do this one. All for making use of your time on the mic and social media to promote yourself as a fighter. But what the duck was Colby Covington thinking? Hashtag nugget. And what he's referring to is post-fight speech where he calls uh, Brazilians just scum, subhuman scum, essentially. Um, and again, you're right, because he, he did, building up to the fight, he was talking smack. And he was being, you know, talking a lot of smack on Twitter. And it, again, it's fucking terrible as well. Like, he is, he is awful. Like, him and T, he gets he took his notes from Tito Ortiz. He is shocking at trash talking. But after the post fight comes, you know, he didn't have to direct anything towards the Brazil. Like he should have directed it straight all to Tyron Woodley. Say, look, Damian Mai is a legend. Honored to fight him in his hometown. It was all promotion. Blah blah blah. That Tyron Woodley want to kick your ass. Let's go. Let's go. There was no need to react and talk like that. I don't know why I did it. I, to be honest with you, I think it's because he's a bit of a dick. Like, he might be the nicest person, but I think there is that bit in him that he is a bit of a dick. Mm. And, and I think he showed it there as well. Um, and he came out afterwards to apologise, like you say on social media, too. Uh, sorry if I offended any of you. Uh, I can't remember what he said now because he's not even worth remembering. But, yeah, he's just a bit of a dick. Uh, well, what's um, what's your thoughts on, on that kind of uh, usage of the microphone and, and, and getting yourself out there? the guy's just a hashtag wanker it's a, <laughs> he's a hashtag wanker but the thing is as well like that was a dangerous situation he put himself in last night when he's come out of that cage those guys in that country like you set those people off and like brazilians are hot-headed man a lot of bad shit goes down in in brazil and it, it doesn't it does you just you can't do stuff like that now i know he's trying to get his point across he's trying to get this fight but his fight he did what he had to do, he backed all he was saying, but there's no need to go the fans after you did it earlier in the week, you've won the fight, there's no need to do that and like it's it just it didn't it did not sit right with me, but at the end of the day he he did what he's supposed to do, he caught the attention of Tyron Woodley. But I do I'm not for I think he just he does it okay, but it just sounds bad, it comes across bad. Uh, and I mean, you had let's just say I keep harping on to Conor McGregor. Conor McGregor went to Brazil when Aldo was fighting, and went down there and he ripped a picture of Aldo. But he didn't. You seen him in the embedded or whatever it was. They followed him around. He was out doing Caparoa in in Brazil, um, and out there. And I bet you, I bet you anything that Colby Covington did not venture even outside of his hotel while he was in Brazil, out of his room. I think he would have stayed in the hotel the whole time. So. He, him seeing Sao Paulo was a dump and the, the people were filthy animals is all probably all BS in my opinion. But um, I just I like like smack talk, but you have to do it well. Chill did it really well. Um, Connor obviously does it very very well. The Diaz brothers kind of inadvertently do very very well with it, but he just does not do it well. But it seems to be working for him because he is getting the champion's attention, and he is. With, with, what do you think with him doing that? Do you think he's garnering more fans or putting more people off? Because I think it's a bit of both. I think he will get some of those arseholes that like stuff like that. But he's got people like me who are like, I like the skill that he has with his grappling, but he's totally putting me off. I so, think that's what he's doing. I think he's he'll gain less but lose more. Mm. And I'm with you because like, I just like fighting dude talking because if you can't smack talk and I know he know he's smart enough to know that smack talk gets you title fights gets you the XYZ gets you here but if you can't do it well just let you fight and do the talking man and when you get a chance on the mic after then I'm not saying smack talk but give just make sure you have a name 
spit the name out and say, I want to knock him out because he's a prick. And that's all you need to say. And then walk off. You don't need to do anything else, but you just can't do it. And it's it, it's like watching really bad WWE wrestling. It's so bad, the smack talk. But anyway, um, the less I talk about how, he, how awful it is, the better, really, because it's painful, mate, even just thinking about it. Adam asked another question, though. No. Uh, he asked the question last time about the bar and the biker girl, and uh, he's got another one for you, Will, but not quite like that. So, if you were an MMA fighter, Will, uh, um, I, I am myself, but would you rather be impervious to concussions and knockouts, basically have a granite chin, or have unbreakable bones and be unsubmittable? Hmm. I would rather have my head than my bones or whatever. I think you need to keep your faculties with your brain. That's going to keep you going longer. Now, I know that like your, your bones are going to heal, but your brain might not be able to heal. If you take a lot of shots, that shit doesn't heal. And it's going to, especially with this concussion fight, I'm watching NFL at the minute. And these guys, like, they take it really, really serious with the concussions. And some guys retire really early in their career because they take those hits. Um, I would rather have my faculties with my head than my bones. They, they will heal up. You will get looked after with that. But with your brain, that's something you really don't mess around with too much. Especially in the fight game. If if, if I was to hear like a fighter was fighting with having like CTE or a concussion syndrome or whatever it is, um, that's scary to me. Like that really is. But with like a an injury with um, like even like broken things, it's just uh, I would rather break my bones than lose my head and my brain faculties and not remember stuff and black out and stuff like that. I'm with you. I would, I would rather have that because, but also for me, from a fighting perspective, the fight's outstanding. Mm -hmm. So immediately I'm thinking, good, because you have to start up standing. So if you crack me, I'm going to be golden. I'd be more inclined to be like a John Lineker and just go berserk and just swing for the fences. And if it gets to the ground, it goes to the ground. You're not going to ground and pound me. Happy days. You have to submit me. Awesome. There you go. And that's what I'd be thinking as well. I'd, be like, I'd want that granite chin because then i think right i was working with my defense my sub defense just work on that uh, but that'd be my choice so uh, again thank you for the questions ladies and gentlemen always welcome and uh, please keep them coming uh any time of the week throw them over we'll keep them on tab and we'll we'll ping them onto the uh, podcast uh, we're looking to possibly do something a bit different uh, next week will uh, something a bit uh, different with the podcast but again that's why we're doing try slowly evolving uh, so thank you all for listening we'll be back next week and will have you got any messages you want to say yeah, just thanks for, for watching, thanks for the questions. Uh, um, I'd like to say this week we're going to try and do some different things on the lead up to a huge card. We're going to have a little bit of free time. I go on holiday from next week. Um, so we're probably going to try and do something before the pay-per-view and we're going to try and do something during the, the three main fights of uh, the pay-per-view as well. Uh, so if, you, if you're up at that time in the morning, you can come and join us, ask us questions, um, what you think is going down with the fights. But just keep on the support, keep on with the questions. And uh, just try and tell a friend who can tell a friend that gets more people coming in. It's, it's slow but surely getting there. But even if it doesn't mean John just love talking fights and the rest of people out there that listen, which is awesome for us to hear. Um, but we're going to try a couple of new things and we're getting to that time of the year where we'll probably start making a few plans for 2018 and doing a few things. Uh, we'll let you know in due course where we're going to go for that. But thanks. Thanks for the support as always.